everybody, this is Denise from Foreskin Micro Farm, and this is a studio vlog. I'm going to try to explain everything that's going on here all in one pass. Um, I feel like I haven't made any like real videos in a long time, which is kind of not true, because I did make a video on the breed study, but it's just been really complicated um, over the holiday season, and I'm pretty sure you can understand that. And I'm getting back into the swing of things and kind of making out my list of things that need to be attended to um, for the video making. First off, I have to apologize to the, to the people for the Spinner's Book of Yarn Designs because I have like completely, I've been AWOL in that group. And it's just been, like I said, a lot of things going on. So I'm going to go into the section on woolen yarns. Uh, which spinning for woolen is one of my least favorite ways to spin, but I'll get into that later. What I've been really focusing on um, for the past few weeks is uh, trying to beef up my Etsy shop. And as you know, I don't really do a lot of sales, uh, mostly because marketing is kind of not my thing, but I've been trying to move things along a little bit more business-like because basically when I'm making videos, which is what I really actually enjoy doing, teaching is what I enjoy doing. But when I'm done making the videos or done teaching something, objectively I'm left with all this stuff, um, either fiber or yarn or finished product that really has no use for me. Um, when you've been doing all this fiber art stuff for a very long time you make a lot of stuff and you don't always have a home for it to go and so everybody always suggests well you should sell it which is harder than it sounds especially if you're not particularly sales savvy or business minded so just out of necessity uh, of not wanting things to just hang around uh, without any use, I've decided to really, really try selling stuff. And then it, it kind of gives me a little more um, flexibility with the videos I'm making uh, because I have a purpose for where these things are going. So what I've really been working on um, is more dyeing. I've gotten into that Pantone color of the month thing for the past few years. I feel it's really important not because I'm so much into trends, but it takes me out of my usual colorways most of the time and kind of forces me to, you know, change up and do a little something different. Um, and it, it does kind of help me to have a desire to pay more attention to market trends because let's face it, if you're selling stuff, uh, you need to pay attention to market trends. So this year's color is classic blue, which is like right up my alley. And I guess classic blue does not really take me out of, out of my color palette because I love blue. It's like my favorite color. There's always something blue going on. But Pantone put together um, several other color palettes to go with their blue. So having those colors to match the blue is going to uh, give me something cred to work with. So at any rate, so I'm dying up all this blue fiber, having a grand old time, and I've got to do something with it. So I decided to do the color of the month fiber bags. I'm just going to produce a few of these bags uh, every month and a different fiber or a mystery wool or whatever, the usual four ounces of fiber and a couple different ways of whatever my color is for the month. So I started off the Pantone color uh, blue. So I have these four different variations of blue. And I got a new bag tag going on. I'll jazz it up as I go along, but this is my rough draft of it. And I'm adding to the fiber bag stitch markers. I am really enjoying making lots and lots of stitch markers. And those will come in a set of four with the fiber bag or they're available for purchase by themselves. 
in my Etsy shop. These ones come with the fiber bag and these ones are available for purchase. So I'm really into these stitch markers, which are kind of cool. I don't wear much jewelry. Actually, I almost never wear any jewelry, but I sure do love beads and the little findings, all the little charms. So it just, just kind of gives me a little way to play with things. So, of course, one craft tips into another. And uh, I started messing around with the polymer clay as an alternative to uh, some beads and things. And uh, you know what? This is just really cool. If you haven't tried polymer clay, it's really fun stuff. This is supposed to be a ball of yarn. Let me move that into you. There you go. And then this is a Fimo, I think, shimmer clay. And this one is a Craft Smart clay. And it's got the knit pattern on it on both sides. It's kind of big. I'm not really sure what to do with it. Uh, this one would probably make a nice zipper pull. But I'm just playing around. So uh, for those of you who order stitch markers from me, you'll probably find these little guys popping up as the freebie uh, in your orders while I'm playing around with them. So <laughs> that's just something, you know, going on there. And then, of course, I'm trying to really um, experiment more, too, with my paper crafting. So I have all of this vellum, dress vellum. It's a, a roll for making dress patterns. I've got a lot of it. And I do make dress patterns out of it. But I also decide to try a little bit on the cards. It's not as heavy as the usual, you know, card making vellum. But it's still pretty nice and solid. So I did the stamp lightly on the vellum. And then underneath, stamping and coloring. And I think what I'm going to do next time for this vellum part right here, I think I'm going to try uh, the heat embossing it with a black onto the vellum. And then you really will get that depth and definition from the cards. And this will be a series of cards. And I really like this flower design. I actually like this flower design all by itself, just basic black and white. So I might do a few of those as well. My coloring medium of choice, most of the time, is the alcohol marker. Um, I, I want to do more watercolors. Uh, the watercolor cards are a little pricey. So... Um, as I get better and better at my card making, I probably invest in some watercolor cards. But I really like the alcohol markers. I like the blending and the shading. And it, it takes a little practice. I'd say for me, it probably took me about four months of constant coloring and a lot of Sandy Alnock and Jennifer McGuire videos. And I think it's uh, Kelly Latavola. I hope I said it right. Uh, before I could really get a good understanding of how to blend the medium. I oil paint, and every medium is different. So if you understand blending and oil painting, it changes a little bit for watercolors, and it changes a little bit for alcohol markers, and it changes a little bit for color pencils. Uh, I, just, I really enjoy stretching my knowledge of those different mediums and really trying to... Uh, get the same or similar effects across different mediums. I still haven't quite mastered how to get the galaxy effect uh, in the alcohol markers like I can get from watercolor or acrylic. And I've seen it done with markers. I just haven't really figured out how to get that yet. That's basically where I'm at with that. I am doing a series on beginning spinning for my Angora spinners. Uh, bunny spinners group so I'm at the spindle again and you can find that on my channel that's pretty much what I'm doing with spinning of course that and the spinners book of yarn designs on woolen I spun up that big project for uh, the magazine and so I'm just kind of resting the spinning except for that particular uh, video 
but I am in the in the background. There's always more than one project going on. I can tell you that. I'm knitting a pair of fingerless knits for a friend. And actually, they're probably one of being wristers and not even fingerless knits. And I'm doing it with the black alpaca. She wanted some Angora, but as we all know, Angora is not really truly black. So it was either the the gray al the gray Angora or the actually true black alpaca. So I went with that. If you've ever tried knitting anything in black, you know this can be complicated. And I'm finding it a lot more complicated than even I thought I had. I know there was a reason I had left this yarn in the back burner, but I so desperately wanted black alpaca. And I really enjoyed spinning it. So now it's time to put it to work. This is an Angora scarf that I just finished recently. And this is the old shell pattern. Um, I'm pretty sure if you've seen any of my other videos, you've seen this a lot. Uh, it's one of my go-to patterns that I really like. And uh, this is from Single Angora Yarn. Now, this particular skein, or actually it's more than one skein of yarn. I think I spun this yarn. It's been, it's been a couple years. And originally I had spun it for my Etsy store and I was selling Angora singles to be plied with whatever it is that someone might want to ply Angora singles with. And so I had a little bit of the single left. And as I was going through and cataloging my stash, I came across it and decided, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and use up all these little bits of yarn that were spun maybe for samples or are left over from different weaving projects. And you know, I couldn't resist the Angora. And I want to say that this is spindle spun. Uh, I didn't tag any of these, though I'm pretty sure if I went back to uh, some of my posts, I could really figure out exactly how this was spun. Because if it's not on Facebook or Instagram or in some video somewhere, it, I have a picture of, it, of what it actually, uh, what I did to get it. So I'm just going to assume that it's spindle spun because almost all my Angora is spindle spun. It's just my preferred method for spinning Angora. It's just a more intimate spin for me. And since these are my hand bunnies, you know, that I've raised, um, it just kind of gives me that sort of connection with them. So I have no idea. Well, that's not true. I don't really know what the yardage is, but I have a, a general idea because I'm pretty sure that when I did the singles for sale, I wound them off in skeins of a hundred. So the one complete uh, skein that I found should have been 100. And then there was some smaller ones. And they were probably about 50 yards. So judging from the thickness of the yarn, which, like I said, it's a single and it's pretty thin, and the length of the actual uh, scarf here, which is maybe about, maybe a little more than three feet, I would probably say that this is about um, maybe 150 or so yards because the two ply Angora that was an ounce that I did for the spinoff magazine, th those were like 110 to 125 yards and this one's longer than that. And so I would say this is probably at least 150 yards. <sighs> This is just one of those things where people ask, two questions I get asked. Can you use single ply yarn? Well, I should probably say three questions then. Can you use single ply yarn? Of course, the answer is yes. It's all about how you spin it. Can you use single ply Angora? The answer is yes. It's all about how you spin it. And can you use Angora with a pattern? Yes. That all depends on how you spin it, and it depends on the actual pattern. Because I've heard that there's no sense in making patterns with Angora because the halo is just going to um, cover up the pattern. And as you can see, that is not necessarily the case. This yarn, uh, it's lace weight easily. And so I used size four needles and I blocked it. Only on one side, really. This side is not really as blocked as this one is. And you can see 
from the pattern. It was way longer than I thought it was going to be, actually. And when I went to block it on the board, I tried to wrap it around the board, and it just wasn't long enough to get a really clean block on the, the other side. Well, the board wasn't long enough. The scarf was way longer. So I didn't really get an open block on this one like I did this one. And you can clearly see all of the halo coming from this fiber. And you can clearly see the shell pattern very well. So I think that turned out pretty nicely for just a random skein of Angora. I'm not a neat freak, but I'm definitely all about order. And I don't know if that came from being a teacher or that was just kind of like part of the whole thing before I started teaching and I just brought it into it, but I'm, and I, you know what? I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I'm fairly forgetful and I lose things. And so my biggest way to cope with that is to put everything in an order to, to assure that I can find it, that I'm still missing that fire star from the move. I know I have it. So when I used to teach, I actually sat down with my library collection and I barcoded all of my books. Now, of course, you know that some a lot of the books, of course, come with their own barcodes and isbins. And, but occasionally you got a book that didn't or it didn't really fit into the system. So I had to make barcodes for some of the books. So I decided that I really wanted to be able to go downstairs uh, to the room and find out what I have inside that room without opening bags. And to be able to do that, I have to find some way to inventory. So I could write down each individual thing I have on a list and number it all. And that's really cool too. But we have lots of modern day technology. So I figured that's the best thing to do. First thing I did is I had to open every bag and I'm a little more, I'd say about two thirds through. Open every bag, take a picture of what is in that bag and label it. So I started with taking the pictures of things and then, uh, you know, saying what type of fiber it was and kind of rough amounts. I haven't weighed it all out yet. So I might go through a second pass and weigh it. Maybe, maybe not. It's almost just good enough for me to see the picture. So I know what it is. And then I put them into categories. So all the dark roving is in one bag, white roving in another bag, um, bats in one bag, stuff for sale or whatever. It's all in the bag. Then here's what was really nice is I printed out barcodes. Okay. So I'll put the item on here and an indicator in the files, what folder it's in. I'll know what bag it's in. And then I scan the barcode here and put this barcode right here into the bag with it. And then I have my master barcode sheet right here. And so I can just go downstairs without all those papers with my phone because, you know, most of us are carrying our phones around all the time. I can grab a bag, scan that bag, know what that bag is about, and then know what's inside the bag by picture view. So I know you're just wondering, where did I get these barcodes? Okay, so um, the program I had as a teacher was ReaderWare. And I actually left my QCAT in the move. Oh, what a sad thing. But of course, like I said, the phones have all this technology in it. And so I was trying to find a software where I could make my own barcodes. If you can, you can just buy barcodes off of eBay. They're not terribly expensive. Um, so if it's easier for you, just buy them there and stick them on. And now that I think about it, I went out into the garage afterwards and realized I had all those labels and I hadn't really thought about it. So I could have put them on the Avery labels and print them out, but I forgot. So I just got these guys and I tagged them and maybe I'll go back and tag the outside of the bags and put them on. At any rate, you can buy them, just buy them in lots, or you could do like me and you can make your own. So you have your own system. So after I tried a bunch of different online barcode generators, and I, I'm almost certain when I did these as a teacher, there was like a really quick online barcode generator. And I'm thinking I made it in Microsoft Word or whatnot. But after going through a bunch of different websites, 
it suddenly occurred to me that all I had to do was go to the Avery website, uh, use their online template program and make barcodes. It took me a little bit of fiddling to figure it out, but afterwards it was pretty easy. And I print out the barcodes and they scan perfectly fine on my phone. So just go to the Avery.com website and follow instructions for making barcodes. You know, just that simple. Uh, get your friends to print them out. I think I might print some out for my friends on some barcode labels. Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, when you choose the label size, this is how I got the two sizes. Uh, when you choose Avery's template label sizes, uh, this was the address labels, I believe, where there's 32 a sheet. And these one right here are the mailing labels where there's 10 to a sheet. And so I figured that this size would be easier to place in the bag. That way I can just hold the bag up and scan it. I wouldn't have to try to look for these little ones. Also, uh, who wants to cut up 30 of these little guys? Since, like I said, I couldn't find, I didn't realize I had the address labels. Nobody wants to cut up 30 of those. So much easier to cut up 10 of those and put those on there. And you, you make them as personal as you want to make them. I just put this right here for four square and then uh, the number. So I am on number 111. So I have 111 different uh, fibers down there labeled. And I went up to 150. And I think that'll take me, uh, for the most part, where I need to go for this particular set. Uh, as I begin to spin more yarns, um, of course, I'll you know that'll change. And I don't have any tags for any of the finished goods that I have done or any of the stitch markers. So I have to decide what I'm going to do about those, whether I'm going to include those in here or whether I might change the indicator down here for the other um, items. So I'll know when I look at it, you know, if, if it's a stitch marker or if it's some type of paper craft or something like that. It might I might label it different down here to make the you know more highly identifiable by barcode. I haven't decided yet, but when I do, chances are there'll be a video about it. So I was asked uh, by a friend if I was planning to go to my twentieth college reunion this year, and I hadn't really planned to. Because since I started all this freelance work, as you can imagine, well, at this stage of the game, um, there are some financial demands that I really can't meet um, at this point in time. So I was going to give that one a pass, but um, I've been asked to go and demonstrate um, the fiber arts while I'm there and also to make... Um, a very large batch of soap samples for the reunion uh, welcome bags. And that really is an opportunity I'd hate to pass up. I have not been back. I haven't been to any of the reunions uh, since I graduated um, for all kinds of reasons. Well, actually, no, really for two reasons. When I had the money to travel, I didn't really have the time. And when I had the time, I didn't really have the money. So I would really like to be able to attend this reunion. So this is a disclaimer. Uh, between now and the time of this reunion, I have to kind of raise some type of funds in order to make the 300 mile trip. And I haven't decided if I'm going to attempt to drive or whether I'm going to try to carpool. Uh, though there's like nobody in my area um, from my graduating class, or that I can even think uh, from the alma mater anyway, not that I know of. And so I have to consider transportation cost um, and all the other things that go along with it, uh, travel. So, uh, and at some point, I'll probably get a more substantial uh, means of employment, but at the same time, I... I really would like to push up 
my sales and production from these creative arts. So I'm just warning everybody that you're going to see more overt advertisements um, for whatever it is I'm making and for my Etsy shop. You may find that I'm actually saying this is for sale. Go to my Etsy shop. You might find it in the links. You might find it in the end cards. You might see it more on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. But I just want to let everybody know um, that's pretty much what's going on. And it's nothing other people don't do. It's just that I don't really feel comfortable doing it. I don't know why, but I don't. But at any rate, you're going to start seeing them because I really would like to be able to raise the funds to be able to go to this reunion. Okay, now, so if you all could just do me a, like a little teeny tiny favor, even if you don't buy anything, if you click the link below and visit my Etsy shop, all of those views boost my ranking in Etsy. And believe it or not, for the sales I have made, the bulk of the views come from my YouTube channel, which also comes from Etsy. So believe it or not, the bulk of my views come from this YouTube channel, which boosts the rankings in Etsy, and then it generates them to show my items more. So. It's just a, a little small favor that you can do even without purchasing anything. And if you happen to see something there that you like, I, I it'd be great if you purchase it. <laughs> if you like it and you like it a little different than once you see it, I do custom. So just ask. All right. Thank you, everybody. That's my really, really quick studio vlog. I'm sure there'll be more to come in the upcoming days or weeks. As soon as I get over the post-holiday big project blues. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Thanks to all my subscribers. If you're not a subscriber, click the subscribe button and then the notification bell in order to receive uh, notifications whenever I do post these random videos. And you can also visit me on Instagram and Facebook. Thank you very much. Have a great day.